Have you ever thought of the concept of hell? Many churches say that when you die and you haven't been a good person, you go to hell. And in that hell, you suffer. You suffer for a long time. You go through torture. And I always wondered, where do these churches get that from? Like, does the Bible really teach that you will suffer if you don't accept the word of God and you'll be elevated into heaven if you do? Is that really what the Bible teaches? In today's video, I will have a look at what the meaning of hell is. You will understand how you can not be fearful of this event, of this place, let's put it that way. And you can then learn how Jesus and God can change you as a person and you do not have to have fear of the judgment or fear of hell. So let's look at the word hell. Where does it come from? Well, if we look in the Greek, which is where it's used in the New Testament, it's the word Sheol or, for example, Gehenna. Jesus uses the word hell as a picture. He uses it as a graphical image that people in Jerusalem would have understood. And the word Gehenna here is a rubbish dump in the, in the outskirts of Jerusalem. And this rubbish dump was a place where there was constant fire. Jesus used these images in his parables to illustrate the power of what God wants and what God doesn't want. And he says that these people will be punished with hell. But what he really means in these passages is that they will die forever. There are a few indications for what Sheol means. And Sheol is basically the word for grave or death. God teaches in the Bible that we will go to the grave when we are dead. There is no life after the grave. I also have an example for this. Ecclesiastes 9 verse 5 says, For the living know they will die, but the dead know nothing. They have no further reward, and even their name is forgotten. I think this is pretty obvious that there is no afterlife. And for everyone who dies without knowing of the gospel or God's calling, these people will rest in the grave, never be resurrected. However, there is also the judgment seat. And this is a very important subject that is mentioned in the Bible, for it says that we will all come before the judgment seat. And Paul writes this to the ecclesias. And these people are responsible. They have the opportunity to come before a righteous judge named Jesus. And Jesus will decide if they are worthy of the kingdom or if they didn't even try in the first place. And so we have these two contrasts. We have those who will be judged and be found righteous, and we have those who will be judged and not found righteous. But it's not a concept of fear here either. God uses his son Jesus, the perfect manifestation of his being, to show and teach and prepare us for the kingdom to come. Obviously, there are people who have gone actively against God. These people will die. Jesus will give them a judgment. And I personally believe some of these people could be the Catholics, the Catholic Church, and especially the Pope. Now, I am putting myself out of the limb here. But from what we read of the Antichrist, I believe these people have actively gone against what God wants. And these popes have named themselves the representation of God on earth, which is pretty arrogant in my opinion. But these people, they will come to the judgment seat and Jesus will say, depart from me, I have never known you. And this might sound harsh, but the great news here is even those who God does not want in his kingdom, who have actively gone against God and taught other people against God, basically brought other people off the way to the righteous kingdom. These people, God will also punish in a way that they will not see the kingdom. And that is all. There will be no hell. There will be no hell fire. There will be no Gehenna fire that will destroy them and consume them. And, and they will be 
dead and that's all, that's the end. We know that there will be a resurrection and this resurrection will come. In 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 13 it says, Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring Jesus, bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we will tell that you tell you that we who are still alive who are left until the coming of the Lord will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with a voice of the archangel, and with a trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left with him will be caught up to him to be together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Now, there's a few topics in here that go into where this kingdom will be. Like, this is a critical passage to actually show that you can also show here that the kingdom will be on earth. But if you want to learn more about that, leave a comment and I will try my best to cover that topic as well. The key point I want to take from this passage is we will have a judgment and those who are dead will be raised first and this judgment will take part and we will be with Jesus as the righteous judge. So what does that mean when we talk about the concept of hell? We read in Ecclesiastes that we will all go to the Sheol, which is the grave, and there is nothing there apart from death. We have no soul that lives eternity, eternally. We have nothing else that happens in this state of death. We lie with the hope that we will be resurrected again. And God will then bring the righteous and those who are responsible to the judgment seat. And now you might be wondering, why hell? Where does this concept of hell come from? Well, if you look into the history, back down the ages, the Romans and Greeks were already possessed with this concept of hell. They, in their own mythologies, used the, the hell and the fire as punishment, as a picture of punishment. And this picture of punishment then carried into the church AD 300-400 when the introduction of Catholics, Catholics and also other denominations that are very prevalent in today's day and age has ad adopted and especially during the Middle Ages the church used this concept of hell the concept of that you will suffer if you don't do XYZ that you will be in this eternal fire if you don't pay the church regularly that you will suffer in hell for ever and the people were not able to actually have a Bible a physical Bible that they could read so they could not check up on the facts that the church was giving them now this is problematic because if you just trust words and you can't find the truth that is hidden in the Bible well you have no other option but to believe those who tell you in this case lies and so we see how through the ages the church, especially the Catholic Church, has used the concept of hell and the fear of hell to influence people to pay towards the churches so they could have priests that could get enough money and also wonderful churches that you see today. It's no wonder that wherever you go in especially Europe and I'm from Germany like every town has a wonderful beautiful church with adornments that are huge and just amazing and I'm just amazed how the people were exploited for the church to make this church a beautiful place but at what cost so maybe you are wondering this is all sounding pretty gloomy and sad what is in there for me like what if i fear this hell well let me tell you there are so many channels on youtube 
and there are also so many other sources that will encourage you to actually be fearful and do XYZ. Get saved, they often say, in the name of Jesus. And while that is the end <laughs> solution that we commit ourselves to Jesus, and I'm convinced that this is important, I want to encourage you to not do it out of fear. The good news is the good news for a reason. We have the opportunity to meet with our God in future in the kingdom and with his son as the righteous king. And that opportunity and encouragement and hope is what keeps me going and so many others as well. It shouldn't be out of fear that we decide to commit our lives to Jesus, that we commit our lives to service in God, that we get baptized and say, hey, we want to live this uncomfortable life of being in a situation where we put God first and not man. We want to focus our hope on the true biblical basics. And these Bible basics do not include a concept of hell, of fire, of suffering for those who do not accept Jesus. You can open the Bible, you can study it, and you can try and prove me wrong with Bible passages, and I encourage you to do the study yourself and find it out. Once you've done this, go and look at what the Bible actually says. Look at how it applies to your life, and look if this concept of fire and hell is really something that Jesus teaches that everyone will have who is not baptized and not accepting of the good news of God. Just think of this, God does not want anyone to suffer. He made us in his own image and it is only our sinful nature that has destroyed the world and made this place a place of disaster. So for you and me, this means we can study the Bible, we can look at it, we can encourage one another. And I want to use this outlet as an encouragement to you. Take the time, look at it, discuss it, write a comment, and let's go deeper and be free of this fear. Christ says in the Bible, the truth has set us free. And God inspired this word so that we can believe that God has truly set us free. We do not need to fear. This is the good news that we have. It's a good hope. It's a wonderful hope. And I want to share this with you. God wants to share this with you. I believe that once you open your Bible, try to read it without any preconceptions, that you will discover what all of this is really about, that there is no basis for hell in the Bible. Thank you so much for tuning in and if you want to watch another video, click here.